on the buzz meter this Sunday with both sides here in Washington still struggling to avoid a government default just five days from now are the media adding to the acrimony surrounding the shutdown and just trumpeting the charges and counter charges. But President Obama back to the blame game. They hate blaming the extortionists, arsonists, um, ransom, et cetera, et cetera. The president's using, I think, the, the right words. He talks about extortion, really strong language about even criminality. Is the press largely blaming the Republicans in this debacle? During a very long presidential press conference, not one question on the problems plaguing Obamacare? What gives? And should conservative commentators have agreed to an off-the-record sit-down with President Obama? Charles Krauthammer weighs in on that. Plus, a conversation with Megyn Kelly about her new primetime show, her view of the mainstream media, her insecurities, and yes, her appearance. People always focus on the looks thing when they look at the Fox News talent. And I mean, I am here to tell you, I don't really look like this. Neither do I. I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. We very much enjoy getting your feedback. Send us a tweet. It's at Howard Kurtz. And as usual, we'll read the best ones at the end of the program. No deal on the shutdown, no deal on default, and no shortage of harsh rhetoric these days, not just from President Obama and the Republicans, but from media commentators as well. And some interviews on cable news have ranged from contentious to downright shrill. I mean, that's how pathetic I think news reporting has become when we won't ask tough questions to the administration. Well, we've I asked come questions up, to I'll both take sides. All, uh, that, that's well, not fair. Uh, uh, do you ask that question, Andrea? We have, ask we the question. have asked that question. We have actually reached out to the Democrats with a compromise position. Congressman, that's it, not fair. Don't you dare put this passed, back on, on me. You on. know full well, well. No, no. Oh, you know full well you attached Obamacare and defunding it. Am I a guest on the new show? Am I here to listen? You're getting special perks and special breaks for yourself. So cut the crap. You, and stop lying to the audience. No, you... So is the coverage providing more heat than light? Joining us now, Lauren Ashburn, Fox News contributor and a former managing editor of USA Today. Jim Pinkerton, contributing editor at American Conservative Magazine and a Fox News contributor. And Dana Milbank, columnist for The Washington Post. Is the blustery and confrontational tone of much of this coverage helping people understand the situation? I, I'm not sure if it's helping people. It might be, but I think that this bombastic blather really... The driving force behind this is blockbuster ratings that cable outlets and network outlets get from this. You know, the media are grandstanding, and I think that they're seemingly pushing partisan agendas even when they're not on opinion shows. And maybe it's that they're angry about this whole thing as much as we are. You know, or maybe it's just that, you know, they're engaged in the story. But whatever it is, the, the bigger question here is, how is this fiery rhetoric helping America? And I always used to say, tone it down. Everybody tone it down, tone it down. But outside of the slander and, you know, the jihadists well, and all that of aside. that. Yeah, leave all that aside. I really do think that this could be good for the country and that, because you know, people are the electorate's engaged and many more people understand the definition of debt ceiling as preventing default. But there is, Jim Pinkerton, a lot of grandstanding and a lot of um, the tone, I think, has been almost as heated as we hear from the politicians. And in some of those interviews, you saw a Republican congressman really pushing back against journalists making them the issue. Right. right. Republicans are fighting a lot harder, I think, than they did in the last shutdown back in the mid-90s. And, of course, they have more support in the media than they did back then. But I think, I think part of the agenda you see in the dog that didn't bark, I mean, for example, the press conference where nobody asked about the Obamacare rollout. Uh, that was too much even for the Washington Post's Eric Wimple. He thought, gee, that's kind of strange that nobody would ask about that. Uh, when you see that kind of silence uh, uh, from the mainstream media on an important issue, uh, you wonder if, if they only want to push the confrontation angle of the shutdown as opposed to the substance of what people are experiencing when they, when they go apply for health care. We'll come back to the presidential press conference, but Dana Milbank, I wonder whether some of these anchors, I mean, some of those clips we played, we could have played 10 more, but it's been a sure. lot of very uh, contentious exchanges between uh, people on TV and, and, and guests. Um, could it be possibly that the anchors are trying to exploit these moments and, and, create, and, and, and create good television? I am shocked that you would suggest such a thing. <laughs> I thought you might be. Um, 
Well, I mean, surely reporters have a, a right to be angry. This is the second or third weekend they've lost to this uh, controversy, and many of them have had to cancel vacations. This okay, is a so very a sad situation. Personal agenda here. I believe that is a personal agenda. Having to work overtime about this situation, but uh, I, it, look, I, I think uh, that the, the press is more reflecting the mood than setting the mood, and uh, it, the people are hysterical and hyperbolic out there, uh, and it's really riled not just people here in Washington, but uh, the country. And I think the press. Is that our role? That in its Is that hysteria. our role? If people are hysterical and angry well, and fed up, then we act hysterical well, look, and angry I did and fed a up? couple of columns this week that not related to the shutdown of the Supreme Court, uh, the, the Washington uh, football team. Nobody actually read those uh, <laughs> um, uh, because people are only interested in hearing more hysteria. So I immediately got hysterical about the shutdown. I, I, I think. Mr. Bilbank put it well. He got hysterical on the shutdown. His column the today, for example, in the Washington Post, Absolutely. joined by Maureen Dowd and Ross Douthat and Chris Eliza. I mean, I think the media pile on, on this has been pretty astonishing. They don't have the power they used to have, but the mainstream media would love to have the election, the midterm elections today, because they think the Democrats would win let, big. Let me jump in, because you mentioned Ross Douthat of the New York Times, who is, of course, a conservative columnist, and he's not the only conservative commentator who has been uh, highly critical of the whole Republican strategy of trying to force this shutdown in, in order to defund Obamacare, which obviously is not happening. Douthat writes this morning that this is self-evident folly that every sensible person, including most Republican politicians, could recognize the shutdown fever would blow up in the party's face. So when you say the media aren't being fair, it's also some people on your side. Uh, it's the mainstream media as a class. The, the Cleveland Park to Georgetown to Bethesda class of journalists is unanimous that the Republicans are ogres. Um, and you, even if Republican or Democrat, you aren't, uh, Kathleen Park is another one in the Washington Post. You're not acceptable in, in polite society if you don't agree the Republicans are, as a, as a doubt that column said, like the, like the bad guys in right. Apocalypse Now. Right, but the media consensus is that the Republicans got killed in this political battle because of not having an end game. And then you have the polls coming out from the Wall Street Journal and NBC, which show that the Republican Party, 24% of respondents have a favorable opinion about the GOP. And they're even mentioning that you know President Obama has a 37% approval rating. But the other number is worse. So that is defining the media narrative, no? It, it, it is, but look, I'll tell you, I think the, the mainstream media, the liberal narrative that the Washington Post is the leader of has about another few days to go. When the debt ceiling thing gets settled, which I assume will be next week, if it does, but, but I'm pretty sure it will, I think you're seeing a new change. I mean, the front page of the New York Times today, Obamacare glitches. Uh, the front page of the Washington Post, the front page of the Chicago Tribune, there's a new story coming, which just to say it deals with the fact that people, the, the health care system isn't working very well, and when the smoke clears and the Obama and the exemption for congressional staffers survives, I think next next Sunday will look a lot different. I want to pick up uh, with Jim Pinkerton's point because uh, it seemed to me that you have all of the liberal columnists, maybe some people would say liberal media, against the Republican position, position here. Whether they agreed with the, the funding strategy or not, it simply hasn't worked. And now everybody's scrambling to try to avoid what would truly right. be catastrophic, which right. is a government default. But on the other hand, you have many conservative commentators. And this was true from the beginning, Charles Krautheim and others saying, this is folly. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jim says that uh, it's, there's more of a class divide here, perhaps, necessarily, than an ideological divide. Well, I, I mean, uh, you know, Jim is saying when the smoke clears, maybe we'll get to this uh, Obamacare story. But the problem is the conservatives are the one who set this house on fire and created all this smoke in the first place. We would today all be talking about what an awful rollout of Obamacare this was if the, the Ted Cruz wing of the Republican Party hadn't shut down the government and hadn't uh, propelled us on this road to default. So now to say the press isn't focusing on Obamacare, well, if the house is burning down, you can't be complaining that we're not focusing on, on the groundskeeping. And I think that's what's, what's happened. And yet, despite that focus, and it's a very good New York Times story explaining that this disaster of a computer glitches is too, too soft a word, has been building for months, and then there were warnings and all of that. Uh, if it's such an important subject, how is it that President Obama, how long did his news conference go on? Four or five hours? Uh, <laughs> right. It seemed like it. I yeah. was like, come on, i got to eat lunch. Didn't get a single question about the problems with this health care rollout. It was not a good outing for the press. They were not aggressive. No one put him on the spot. I went through the transcript. What assurances can you give to those affected? How worried are you? I'm wondering what you and your administration are telling people. So I wonder if you could weigh in on this later case. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the budget process. You know, you've got to be tempted to sign these bills. And finally, is there anything that you wish you had done differently in 2011? This is not hard-hitting journalistic interviewing, especially not the kind that we used to see in the White House right. press corps. Looking ahead, 
Sean Gallagher, writing for the website Ars Technica, makes the point that the government's IT systems are so awful, and he cites lots of reasons why they're so bad. He said this is not going to get better. That's a story that will be hopefully good journalists will be following uh, for years to come. But just to circle back to the press conference, Dana, um, uh, the president got a friendly question from the Huffington Post, Sam Stein, and many of the other questions that seemed to me it was almost just too inside baseball about mm -hmm. strategy as opposed to somebody saying, how are you letting this happen? Uh, but one thing that President Obama did was, he avoided calling on any of the correspondents for the major networks who tend to ask more aggressive or at least uh, have a little more showmanship in their uh, questions. And, well, and he said at one point, I'm following the list that Jay, Jay Carney, the press yes. secretary, gave me. And you know, we've talked before about this, uh, this press conference format, and he's able to work around the room and try to work things uh, to his advantage. He had one story that he wanted to tell, and he was lucky in the sense that that's the main story uh, of the moment. Uh, I, I would like to have seen more Obamacare questions. In fairness, that was the leadoff question in his interview with the Associated Press, you know, a couple days before that. Sure, I think, I think I think that's a not there's not the best format uh, for the for the press to be uh, getting good answers out of this guy. Uh, before we go to break, Jim, are you challenging the the the, ne the dominant narrative in the media that this has been at least in political terms, at least in public relations terms, a very bad couple of weeks for Republicans? I, I, no, I won't dispute the polls, and I won't dispute that. I just simply say that some people are piling on as hard as they can. <laughs> you want to respond to that? <laughs> well, I, I mean, we're focusing on the story of the moment. I mean, the I, I think Jim agrees that it has been a debacle and if you look at it um, Obamacare is up seven points in the way the public views it so by all measures this uh, has been a debacle and I think people are just pointing it out I don't know if that's piling on but uh, if that's right. piling on, piling that's on is in the eye of the beholder <laughs> ahead on media buzz my sit down with Megyn Kelly but first the other big debate that's consuming Washington the Redskins should some news outlets be boycotting the team's name